together this morning. It's the beginning of this prayer asking you to forgive us, forgive us of our sins for all the things that we've said and done and even thought this past week or even this morning, Lord. And, and we trust that you'll forgive us of those because you tell us and you assure us so many times that we, when we as Christians ask for forgiveness, you're there to give it to us. And we're so thankful for that this morning, Lord. We're so thankful for all the blessings that you give us each and every day, far more than we deserve. And we can spend the next hour or the next few hours of this day just trying to thank you for every blessing that we we receive from you. And we can still never, never, never thank you for all the things that you do for us, Lord. But we're, we're thankful this morning for this congregation that meets here in Kimball and, and what it means to this community, what it means to other communities around and different states and even different countries, Lord. We're just so thankful for the work that's done here now and for the work that's been done here in the past. We're thankful and we ask your blessings upon our, our leaders, our elders, and their families as they as they lead us to try to keep us on the straight and narrow path to be the kind of church that you would have us to be. And we pray, Lord, that if, if this church ever starts venturing off the path that you'd have us to go, that you would direct your elders to keep us on the path that they need us to go. We're thankful for Billy and all that he does and has done over the years in this congregation, serving as a minister and as an elder, and we just thank you for all that he's done. We're thankful, Lord, for the elders and their decision to put our services on Facebook Live during this COVID crisis. We know, Lord, that they must have struggled mightily trying to make the decision to not have services. But we know, Lord, that they serve as shepherds and they want to protect their flock and they make the best decision that they think possible for us here. And we're thankful for that and we're thankful for the technology that has made it to where we could, we could while we weren't needing, and even now, Lord, that our members, some of them can't come or choose not to, that they can still worship with us, Lord, and we're just thankful for that technology. We're commanded to pray, pray Lord, for our leaders. And we do that. But not only our church leaders, Lord, but we pray for our elected representatives. We ask this morning that you be with our president, our congress, our governors, our state representatives, right on down to the city officials, Lord, as they, <clears throat> they struggle with this virus, as they struggle with the protest and the rioters that's going on, and all the first responders, Lord, that they have to deal with these things. Give them strength, give them wisdom, and give them judgment. And, and just be with them, Lord, as they have to make these decisions on the spur of the moment many times, Lord. We just, we, just, we just don't know what they have to go through at those times, but we just pray that you'll be with them as they make those decisions to try to do best as well for, our, for our people. Lord, we know so many of our, our family are not here today. Many of them are been traveling. We pray that you bless them and keep them safe as they as they journey. We pray, Lord, that you that you bring them back and all of us back to our home safely today, Lord, and just bless us as only you can. And on this Father's Day, Lord, we pray that you will be with all the fathers throughout the world, all the fathers of this congregation. Lord, we we're thankful for them. We're thankful for our families. And we pray, Lord, that as we go forward in this country, that the fathers will step up, that they will lead their families in the way that they should go and try to guide them toward getting them to heaven. Because we know, Lord, that a father's biggest responsibility is to try to get his family to heaven. And we're, we just pray that you'll be with all the fathers on this day. Be with everyone that's in our bulletin on the sick list. And with those one that will be mentioned later, Lord, you know who they are. And we just pray, Lord, again, that you'll be with all of them today. Be with this congregation as it goes forward. Bless us as you have in the past. And again, forgive us for sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hero. 
several sons of Paul's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, inside of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth.
906. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you here with us today. It's good to have all of you with us who are viewing this service via the internet. You know, that's a great honor and a great privilege that we can do that. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, it is a tremendous responsibility, uh, especially in times like we live in today. In Malachi, chapter 1, Malachi makes a statement. He says, a son honors a father, and a servant honors his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? People of Israel had become rather lax in their return. They came back. They laid the foundation of the temple. They were discouraged. They finally finished the temple. Ezra returns. And they restore the law. <coughs> Nehemiah returns. They rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And fairly much so become an independent governorship within the great Persian Empire. But by the time Malachi comes along, Things had kind of gotten into a rut. Now, people have all kinds of de definitions of a rut, but basically a rut is defined as grave with both ends knocked out of it. And that's pretty much what Israel was in. But as we think about dads today, pardon the history lesson, but before the Industrial Revolution, Families spent a lot of time together. Usually sons learned the trade of their father. Fathers usually didn't work very far from home many times. Husbands and wives were engaged in the same craft. But when the Industrial Revolution came along, boy, that, that went to the wind in a hurry. During the Industrial Revolution, Men left the homes and they went and worked in industry. They developed this cult for women and the proper place for a woman was always and only in the home. And so things changed. We actually got some skewed ideas. And until recently, that was pretty much the case. And then all of a sudden, here comes the virus along, and moms and dads and kids are all thrown into the home together, and dads start spending more time with their children. Now, if you want a positive, I think that's positive, that has come out of this virus. That dads, many of them, are spending more time with their kids. Now, I realized during school time, there were some interesting things that went on. Uh, Holly actually expelled Kenley out of homeschool. Uh, and I think probably a lot of parents wound up doing that because definitely they weren't prepared to teach in the home. And yet, Dad's spending more time. That's a good thing. But let's make sure dads, as we spend more time, we're the right kind of dads. So biblically, what is a dad supposed to be? Well, number one, they're the leaders in the home. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 gives us a hierarchy. And there really is a hierarchy in the world. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. So you get that hierarchy. Kind of like the military, Mike. You got the general, you got the colonel, 
you got the manger, and so we had it. God, in this case, commander of chief, husband, head of the wife, and we many times look at that and we say, and why? Well, Ephesians 5.23, Paul gives us a biblical reason. He says, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. Now keep in mind in this chapter, because we're going to come back to it. Now why that? Well, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13 tells us, for Adam was first born, then Eve. So we kind of get this hierarchy as a result of order of creation. Now the problem a lot of men have had with Ephesians chapter 5 is it goes to their head. I am the absolute ruler of the home. There's only one absolute ruler. He's in heaven. So let's be sure to keep that in mind. The head of Christ is God. There's the absolute ruler. So what are husbands supposed to do as being leaders in the home? In Paul's writing to the Colossians about the same subject, in chapter 3 and verse 19, he says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter against them. Oh, that's what God means by leadership in the home. Husbands are to provide a loving environment, a loving leadership for the entire family. Now, as I said, keep your mind on Ephesians 5. Just as Christ loved the church. Isn't that exactly what he did? Was Christ coming along with about a lot of arbitrary demands and everything else? Or did Christ come along as a loving leader to establish his church. So there's the example. There's the pattern. That's what leadership is all about. Now, unlike today, Mike, and I will criticize the modern military here, in the ancient world, leaders didn't command 30 miles in the rear. Leaders were just that. They were out front. They were leading. As sad as this may sound, go back and restudy Civil War history on both sides. And go through some time and check out how many generals died in battle. It will stagger you as to how many did. Why? Because they were out front. Husbands, as leader of the home, you're out front. Okay, you know what that means? You're setting the direction. Now, what direction are you setting? Are you setting a direction toward heaven? Are you setting a direction toward God? Are you setting a direction for your family that God and Jesus really want you to? This is the kind of leadership we desperately, desperately need in homes today. Two years ago, as I was wrapping up my U.S. history class, I always give my students eight problems, as I view them, that exist in the United States today. And one of those eight problems is dealing with drugs, violence, gangs, murders in the street, all of these things that we hear so much about on the news. And I always, with these eight things, pause and ask the students, what can we do about it? And it was interesting, one of my students said, if we had more dads in the home, we'd have a whole lot less people in the streets. Wow. What an insightful 19-year-old right now, pardon this. There are not many of those running around. So here was 
wasn't an insightful 19-year-old. If we had more dads in the home, we'd have less. Why do these young men especially join gangs? Because they're not accepted at home. They don't have any activities. And so in the gang, they can be accepted. But as we think about this leadership and this husband and wife relationship, 1 Peter 5, 3 and verse 7 is very important for us. It says, and is being heirs together of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Heirs together. Do we have husbands and wives today that are united together in Christ so this leadership process is what it should be. Secondly, Bible points out husbands are providers. Psalm 104, verse 23, man goes out to his work and labors until the evening. Whoops. After Adam and Eve are leaving the garden, what is one of the things Adam is told you're going to do? You're going to have to work you're going to have a job. And of course everybody says one thing is the oldest occupation in the world and it is not. Read scripture. What is the oldest occupation in the world? Farming. What Adam was. He was a farmer. And so he had a job. He had to go out and labor. God's just not going to unless you're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Dump it in your lap for you. Proverbs 12 and verse 11. He tills his ground and will be satisfied with bread. So go out and get a job. Do things. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. That you aspire to lead a quiet life to mind your own business and to work with your own hands. There are even times in the book of Acts we find Paul, who was a full-time missionary, had to take time out to work in an occupation and a trade to be able to continue to support himself. And as we find out from Scripture, he was a tent maker. And so even Paul was doing that after he became a great missionary for God. But a couple of scriptures that are important for us. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbelief. So yes. Yeah. God expects us to work. God expects men to be out there. But he makes a promise about it. In the very negative book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon has something positive to say about at least one thing. In chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Yeah, when you're tired at night, boy, you go home and that, that bed really, really feels good, doesn't it, Ollie? <laughs> you should have seen a bunch of ants on that mountain yesterday working, trying to get things up and going. I think most of us slept pretty good last night as a result of that. So two positive things about positive. But the third one, if you have to say one of these is more important, this is the most important. A husband is to be the one who shares spiritual things. Genesis 18 and verse 9. I love this passage. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him 
that they will keep the way of the Lord. The Bible's speaking of Abraham here. Now let's think a moment about the legacy of Abraham. If we're not careful, we limit that to the Jews. But are we not heirs as Christians of the legacy of Abraham? Was Abraham not promised to be the heir of many nations? And that he would have a seed that would bless all nations. And that seed he was to have to bless all nations was Christ. So you realize that as Christians today, we are heirs of the promise that God made to Abraham long before the law of Moses. Way back in the law of and so, as God looked to Abraham to direct his household to obey him, that's precisely what God looks to husbands to do today. Psalm 78, verse 9, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers by the Hebrews. By the way, the Hebrew here is males, not the generic word, that they should make them known to their children. Dads, we have a big job. We need to know God's word so we can share that word with a, our children. You know, one of the fond memories I have of my children when they were growing up is bedtime. Yeah, I was the bedtime guy because I got to go with the kiddos and I got to do the Bible reading and we would have the prayers together. And that's a memory I cherish to this very day. That's fun. That's enjoyable, Dad. That's really a great, great time. And you know, believe it or not, even the little ones are like sponges. Boy, they soak this stuff up. You share Bible stories with them, and those Bible stories stay with them the rest of their lives. So it's a fun time to be able to do something that's important that God wants us to do. Isaiah 38, verse 19. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. Dads, how many of us are doing that? all dads in the church doing that today. You know, in a recent Pew poll, it was found that Americans, like Western Europeans, are becoming more and more and more ad nauseum ignorant of God. You remember what Hosea said to his people in chapter 4, verse 6? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Ignorance of God's word is one of Satan's greatest joys. Oh, he loves it. Because he can get out there and play his little deception game all he wants to. Boy, Satan fears the Word of God. You know how I know that? Because when Satan and Jesus went one-on-one, -on -one, what did Satan do? He's out there throwing these temptations at Jesus. And how does Jesus respond? It is written. It is 
Rip it is. Rip and Satan decided to make an exit. Remember James chapter 4, verse 8? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word of God gives us the power to resist Satan. In the armor that we're described to in Ephesians chapter 6, the word of God actually serves two functions. It's a shield and it's a sword. So it's a defensive and an offensive weapon on our heart. <coughs> and we should use it on the And where do kids get a lot of foundation to do that? Dads. Oh, dads are so very important. But a warning, Ephesians 6 and verse 4, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. John led us in a song. God gives Christian us. We need dads in those Christian homes that are leaders, that are providers, that are spiritual trainers. If you're not a Christian, you can't be the day of God wants you to be. So let me encourage you today. If you never put on Christ, please do so. I don't care how good a dad you may be. When you become a Christian, you're going to be a way better dad. Because that's the kind of dad God wants. So today, if you're here and you believe on Christ with all your heart, and you're willing to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him, why not respond and be baptized? Wash away your sins. Be raised to walk in a newness of life. Be the man God wants you to be. And you know, Several times in Russia, I encountered men who would say, Christianity is weak, it's feminine, it's for women, it's sissy. <clears throat> you ever met more of a man than Jesus? I haven't. How many of these great athletes, overpaid as they are, do we have in this country that would go to a cross and think you're going to see any volunteers. Don't think it's going to happen. Jesus, the man, did. And I'm going to say today, real men are Christians. Real men are Christians. So if you need to respond Oh, in the valley, come to me.